uh, anniversary. Uh, the limits to growth have been published in 1972, so it's exactly 50 years. We celebrated this uh, earlier this year um, uh, with, a, uh, with a bigger symposium already, and uh, we decided that uh, uh, it is the time uh, that uh, to, in the spirit of, uh, of the Club of Rome, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, accompany our current uh, fight for climate neutrality uh, because it fits so well with the initial thoughts uh, of uh, acknowledging that the world resources have limits and now the limits are energy, the limits are also our possibility to put CO2 in the atmosphere, we have to stop this. Uh, and uh, of course with technology, with a lot of brain, as happened with the original Club of Rome, that we were able to, to manage part of the, uh, of the scenarios not all, but uh, a lot. We still hope that we can manage uh, and uh, uh, find solutions to avoid a, a catastrophe, but uh, it's really late. Uh, secondly, the World Energy Council may be a little bit less known, um, uh, but uh, actually the more, um, the, the older um, organization was founded uh, already in uh, 1923, so after the First World War. Um, it has uh, its headquarters in London. We are also having in nearly all states of the world the uh, national uh, chapters of the World Energy Council. And also the World Energy Council has always uh, had the idea of accompanying uh, energy transitions, uh, being, uh, bringing together the experts uh, to discuss solutions for our energy systems, clean solutions, sustainable solutions in uh, ecological, economically and social terms. And this, is, uh, this brings, I think, a very good uh, sy uh, symbiosis with the Club of Rome and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the World Energy Council tonight. So, uh, and it's also the idea of, uh, of uh, both organizations to have a scientific, evidence-based uh, debate on these things, not a politically driven, hysteric debate, but a, a solid, on solid grounds, on empirical grounds. That's, I think, why it's so important to discuss with university, with the two professors who will hold the keynote speeches, uh, Professor uh, Nakicenovic, whom I uh, would warmly welcome uh, here, who is uh, very known in Austria. He's uh, participate. He was also a chair, held a chair in the in the uh, warm welcome <laughs> here at the Technical University. He was uh, vice uh, uh, CEO of the uh, Energy, no, of the IASA, of the International. Um, Institute uh, of, uh, for Applied uh, System Analysis in Luxembourg uh, for a long time and you have been involved on EU level and international level IPCC reports and uh, all of that. You are really known and we are grateful that you, uh, you will be here. Uh, you, will, uh, you will hold the first uh, keynote speak, uh, speech with the more international context. And then of course uh, uh, Professor Haas who holds here uh, the chair at this university for uh, a long uh, time already and he's the head of the energy economic uh, group uh, at uh, this technical university since 1996. So also quite, uh, quite experienced and uh, a long time here. Uh, so we are really happy then to hear also from you your scientific approach uh, to the problems. And let me just, uh, as, uh, as a very short introduction, uh, you gave me, organizers gave me 15 minutes. Uh, some, some minutes have been run out because we started late, but uh, some ideas uh, still from my uh, side to, to try to, to give a little bit uh, uh, an idea of what was the idea behind uh, this, uh, the organizing uh, this evening uh, with you together. <coughs> uh, we are in a big, uh, in a big, uh, a big, we have a big task ahead. And if we look at, uh, if we start looking at, uh, at Austria, uh, we see that in electricity terms, we are quite well. We are number one in Europe. We have 75% of our electricity is already green and the government has already put in place our uh, Ener uh, Renewable Energy Promotion Act to achieve already by 2030, 100% of on balanced uh, green uh, electricity. With all the challenges uh, which, which are there because of the intermittent uh, volatile character of the renewables, but, but I think there we are quite on a good path. Uh, and we see we started, we have currently an electricity consumption of 72 terawatt hours. I think the numbers are important. We have 
54 terawatt hours about uh, renewable and the government has the target to uh, to achieve to add some 27 terawatt hours of uh, renewable electricity uh, which is a 50 percent increase because we also expect an increase of electricity consumption by 2030 yeah? and that's of course the a big question what will be the electricity demand in 2030, we are approaching 2030, it's only eight years. Um, and I remember I was involved in the projections uh, some years ago when we made this in the ministry, uh, old times it started in the Ministry of Sustainability uh, at that time, uh, that we did take into account a lot of works that have been on the table of the, of the Technical University also, but also of the Umweltbundesamt, of the Environmental Agency in Austria, and of the, of the Electricity Association, Producers Association. So we had this idea that yes, there will be electromobility, there will be in the, there will be, uh, in, in, in the heating uh, sector, there will, be, there will be some sector coupling needing more electricity. But what we did not really uh, calculate was the, uh, the way the path towards climate neutrality for the industrial sector, for the heavy industry, the energy intensive industry sector, which only has a target uh, to become climate neutral in Austria by 2040. And if you think about steel making, cement and, uh, um, uh, and chemicals, uh, there's really, this is the Austria's biggest emission sector. It's 34% uh, of all emissions. It's larger even than the transport sector. And we see that uh, getting to climate neutrality in this sector will not be only be possible with, uh, with electricity and with energy efficiency, but we will need some molecules, some green molecules uh, to, to uh, cater for also the process emissions which, uh, which, which are there in, in, in steel making. So, and uh, we will need more electricity, so how much will we need more and how much molecules will we need? There is a lot of answers already given in the very recent uh, hydrogen strategy of Austria, and I also would warmly welcome uh, Judith Nayer, who is here from uh, our ministry as uh, the new director for uh, strategic energy policy, and she will be in the debate and maybe give a little bit more insight. Uh, so uh, there's really this task ahead of us, and just to compare, we have, we, as I said, we, we had 72 terawatt hours electricity and 100 terawatt hours still gas to replace. We have 100 terawatt hours fossil gas about. Yeah. So the question is really, uh, uh, we have broad ranges of, of provisions, but how much, how much will we have to cater with, with, with green gases and how much with electricity? How, how much will really the demand be for gases and for electricity? So there are a lot of open questions uh, and I'm happy to, make, uh, to, to have here a first step. Second, a second big set of questions is the European question. Austria is, uh, is in the heart of Europe and we, are, we have interconnections in electricity and gas. We have interconnections in electricity which are high only to Germany. We have so many interconnectors that we basically could import all the electricity for the peak consumption in Austria. Of course, we cannot do that. We don't want to do that. And we cannot do that because also Germany wants to phase out coal and wants to phase out nuclear. Uh, the, the sum of phasing out in Germany is like three times Austria what they will phase out in the next uh, uh, decades. So of course, we cannot rely on that. But we still are embedded in the in, in a electricity market, in a European functioning electricity market. And in gas, it's even uh, more extreme. Uh, our gas transport system, our internal uh, gas market, um, provides for transport opportunities which are manifold, the, uh, the reach manifold the Austrian consumption. We uh, transit, we trade, uh, I think six, seven times the quantities via Austria, transit via Austria than what we consume. Uh, so we are embedded in Europe and so the question will be of course, what can Austria do? What, what has to be adapted on the European level? And I think Mr. Nakicheno, which will be, he's one of the seven experts of the, uh, advising the European Commission in that, that area. So we are also very, uh, uh, very happy to, uh, to hear from you a little bit more. And then the third dimension, so after the European dimension, is really the global dimension. And I would like to remember that uh, last year in September, already from the Club of Rome, uh, we made a, um, made a session, um, uh, a seminar last, uh, last year about this idea of global international partnerships 
between Europe and between, in particular, the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa. These are our natural neighbors, and we have the big chance now uh, in these days to uh, also, uh, let's say, driven by, by the war in, uh, in, in, in Ukraine, to get out of the dependency from, from not only Russian gas, but also from fossil sources from the OPEC countries, and to have new partners, many more new partners, because fortunately, the sun is shining in nearly all member states, uh, or all states around the MENA region, and not only the few who have a lot of fossil sources. So we can build up a complete new network of, uh, of friends and partners, uh, and not only on a few, which uh, will then maybe put pressure upon us and create a, a dependency. So this is a historical chance also, and I would say it's a historical chance uh, in, in three aspects. First of all, I, I think, I'm, I firmly believe that uh, the problems what we have now with Russian gas and the need to get out of this Russian gas should not lead to an idea of complete isola isolationism, isolationism of, uh, of Austria. We are so heavily embedded and uh, we still need to have trade re relations with other states uh, within the Union in the internal market but also beyond. And this is also important, secondly, because we have a lot of technology companies. Uh, we have famous companies. I saw uh, Klaus Fronius, of, uh, Fronius here and many others uh, who have something to offer for uh, our partners uh, around Europe. And uh, we have, I think, also a task not only to say to those states in Tunisia, in Algeria, in, uh, in Libya, we imported now uh, 70 years uh, your gas, your oil. Now it's dirty, we don't want that use it at home, use it somewhere else. No, we want to help those countries to have partnerships on, uh, on let's say, but not col colonialistic, but, uh, but really on the same uh, eye level, I would say, to help them to get also out of the, uh, of the fossil fuels uh, with the help and with sharing also our technologies. I think it's important from uh, small uh, member states like Austria to have this multiplier, this climate multiplier, and to serve as a as a, as a climate ambassador uh, for, for these countries, because CO2 is a worldwide problem, and I think we have to remain engaged with those countries uh, to also to help them uh, to get out of the, of the fossil trap. Uh, and I think that's, that's uh, to be kept in mind and not saying, okay, uh, we have the problem now with Russian gas, so let's, let, let's completely isolate ourselves. Um, and finally, uh, it has a, a third effect if we have good partnership, if we are able to build up in the next, not in the next two years, but in the next two decades, 2040, 2050, if we are able to build up good partnership uh, with uh, those countries around the Mediterranean and, and in the Middle East and also in Ukraine and also in the, in the northern, uh, if you think about offshore wind uh, rims uh, of Europe, we will be able to have access also to a wide, diversified uh, and uh, very cost efficiently produced uh, renewable energy because in those areas there's a lot of sun. These are natural resources which don't cost anything. Fortunately, the sun and the wind is still for free. Uh, and uh, I just came back uh, last week from Jordania where uh, German uh, Vice uh, Chancellor Habeck uh, made a big, uh, organized a big conference uh, with the MENA region. And I can tell you there is a huge enthusiasm uh, in the whole MENA region, uh, in the Mediterranean, but also in, in, in the Near East, to, to get on this, uh, on this train uh, to think about these free, these free, uh, free access to these free renewables and not depending on, on some oil shike who, who, who will uh, uh, close and open uh, the, uh, the oil or gas uh, whenever he likes. So uh, there's a huge uh, momentum right now and uh, I think it's important to approach this, uh, this challenge, what we have, this global challenge of, of, uh, of climate warming with a global approach and also a European approach and not only a national, but still to contribute on the national side. So this was my idea from the introduction. Um, and uh, I hope uh, uh, my expectations are not so high, <laughs> not too high, uh, but, uh, but we, have to, we, have to, we have to go ahead with, uh, with all the scientific knowledge we have in uh, in Austria. And with that, uh, I would uh, ask uh, first uh, Professor Nakijanovic to take the floor and to present us uh, your ideas and uh, your view at this immense challenge. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for this grand picture introduction and for the kind words. And uh, I would also like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak here, both uh, Teuvin, but also <coughs> World Energy Council and the Club of Rome Austrian chapters. Uh, let me just say it's a great pleasure to be back here in this wonderful, really beautiful hall. It just shows that wood is a great material, construction material. I think we all feel very, very nice in it. And also let me mention that I've been working with Reinhard Haas in the Energy Economics Institute for many years here at TEU. So it's always great to be here. And I'll say a few words about WEC and the Club of Rome a little bit later. Let me start my presentation. I've uh, chosen to, to talk about energy transformation for a sustainable and beautiful future. Because my understanding is when we talk about energy transition, we are really talking about changes in the energy system, how we use and produce energy. But I think it needs to be embedded in the broader transition of our societies. It's not a technical economic issue alone, it's also an issue of values. So that's why I've chosen to talk about transformation for a sustainable future, and I hope that it's going to be beautiful as well. So let me then start, though, with my, my presentation with, some, with a metaphor from the Bible. Uh, you've all heard about the four riders of the apocalypse. Uh, the point I would like to make is that it's very easy to be depressed these days about the future. Really, really easy. Uh, we have, have, have the uh, pandemic that's still going on. We have terrible war in the middle of Europe. That means that there is a death. There will be probably also famine following from that war and conquest. So, but instead, I would like to offer a more optimistic future. I hope that we will get out of these multiple crises that are facing us. So that's the next thing I would like to share with you. <clears throat> if you look here, what we have achieved over the last 200 years of industrialization indicates that we have the capacity of overcoming huge crises and challenges as, as humanity. Number one is, uh, I find that always incredibly impressive, life depend uh, expectancy has doubled in the last century, from about 35 years to over 70 today. Another one, when we talk about famine and lack of food, is that one billion people are obese, and that's of course a problem. I, mean, I am also suffering a little bit from that problem. Uh, but let's go hungry. About 700 million go hungry every night. Uh, but there is a fear, of course, that that number is rising by the day, even in Europe. Uh, so. I think we have overcome the hung, uh, hung, hunger crisis, but we need to work very hard to make sure that everybody is fed well. And then something that I, I find you know, surprising, and I think many of you will find surprising, um, that about, let me start by saying, about 8 million people die worldwide from the air pollution. Uh, but um, uh, more die uh, from suicide than from war and violence. About, it's estimated that 10, 10 times less, about 800,000 people die from suicide every year. Of course, we don't know that number, but that's an estimate. And about 10 times fewer die from the war and violence on the order of 60 to 100,000 a year. So we live in an, despite the war, we live in an unprecedented period of relative peace. And I hope that that's going to continue. And the reason why, you know, I think one can be confident that that might be the case is that democracies actually never fight war with each other. And about 50% of global population lives in democratic societies, and I hope that that will increase in the future. So that's my, I, I think we can deal with the crisis, but one challenge is here for all of us long term, and that is the climate change. So I want to start with that. If you look here, um, this is the global mean temperature since the last ice age. Uh, please focus on the last 10,000, 9,000 years, the so-called Holocene, where the temperature has been very constant. Mother Earth has been kind to us. We could settle down, develop agriculture and early civilizations. But the last 200 years of the Industrial Revolution are the hockey stick up. And if you compare that to the Paris range, we are almost there. We are well over one degree global mean temperature in Austria, well over uh, two and a half degrees, as we have concluded in the Austrian climate change assessment 10 years ago. Karl Steiniger is here. He was one of the colleagues. Uh, so we are in the Paris range 
by 2040 for sure, probably much earlier. But already today we have systems, earth systems that are close to tipping. Uh, um, like the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, Greenland, Arctic Summer Ice, Alpine Glaciers that we all know, and coral reefs. So this is one of the biggest threats to us, and this is why we need action. And it's possible to think about the futures that go in that direction. So let me now pay uh, tribute to the Club of Rome, Limits to Growth. Uh, for me, that was a paradigm-changing experience. I have to say, when I got the book in my first in the hands, I know that there were many problems in the book from the economic side that many criticized it at that time, but I think the main message of the book was, in fact, that business as usual is no longer possible in the long run. And this is 50 years ago. And 50 years, the world has more or less gone on the business as usual, and that's called the great acceleration. Um, and here you see the gra graph from the, uh, 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 from the book, and the green vertical curve indicates actually where we are right now. So in retrospect, it was not completely wrong that we, we have big challenges today. And I have a quote here from Dana Meadows. Uh, Dennis and Dana were at YASA many, many times. In fact, YASA and Club of Rome have very similar origins. And she said, I just want to quote this in these days of a war. It's important to think about the history. I love to go there because it is a place of work where my friends from Hungary, R Poland, Russia, and other East European countries are, because that was in the middle of the Cold War. And so I hope that also science in the future will be open. But this was a paradigm change. That's why I wanted to pay respect to the Club of Rome and limits to growth. And the second one is the World Energy Council that I've been also associated for at least 30, 40 years. I know I've attended all of the congresses in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And um, we did one joint study with the World Energy Council global, global en called Global Energy Perspectives. And the black curves that you see about the global emissions are from that study. Uh, that study was published at the, at the Tokyo Congress in 98, so it's almost a quarter of a century old. But you can see the C1 and C2 scenarios are consistent with the two degrees. So even in those days, the modeling work did focus on how one can achieve climate stabilizations without losing quality of life. In the background are the IPCC scenarios in green and red. I will not comment on them, just see the full range. There were also low scenarios like in the VEC, but the point I would like to make is the red curve. That's where we are today. So even our highest scenarios did not anticipate the extent of the great acceleration and what that meant for the emissions. Uh, and this is, I think, the biggest challenge we have. If you look here, this is one ton of CO2. And just imagine or <laughs> recognize that we emit 40 billion tons every year, and last year was the highest increase ever. So we are on a different pathway than we should be on, and uh, we have alerted to that in the Global Energy Assessment, as was also published in 2012. Um, we hoped at that time that there would be one of the SDGs, energy, because in Millennium Development Goals, energy was not on the forefront, even though it's the key. And we concluded that there would be three things that one needs to do. First of all, make sure that nobody is left behind, that everybody has access to clean and sustainable energy. Second is to improve efficiency. Today, I would also say sufficiency. And double the share of renewables by 2030. Uh, and um, I think we are on the way there, but still lots of heavy lifting, lots of Herculean effort to go there. And I think that these three um, recommendations that actually went in the SDG 7, Sustainable Development Goal 7, are still valid today um, from 2015. And this is how I see the Sustainable Development Goals, and this is why I would argue that the energy transition and needs to be embedded in the overall transformation. You can see here in foreground uh, 13 and 7, 13 is climate, energy is clear that all of these goals are related. And the reason why I like this unorderly graph is that it shows that we need to take them all together. I don't think we can pick one out. Uh, this is required to achieve the grand transformation and energy transition, I think, then can be achieved in, in that context. And in the 
in the world in 2050. That's another initiative that we worked on over the past years since the SDGs have been adopted. We thought that there needs to be some scientific underpinning to the great political commitments to achieve the SDGs by 2030, and we are clearly behind doing that. And so what we have done is we have reduced the complexity of 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets, if you just think about it, it's impossible to even remember all of them, to six transformations uh, that need to be achieved together. And decarbonization and energy, I would say, is the key. And that's why I put it in red here. Uh, so that's, I think, at the international level. So we, need, we know where we need to go. If you take the sustainable Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, I think that gives us the vision that we need to achieve um, by the middle of the century. And in Europe, I would say we also have that vision. Um, the European Green Deal, at least for me, is a great gift, gift to all of the Europeans. I think it shows the way forward. If you, if you look at the left side, all of the left side is associated with energy. So energy, again, is the, is the key in the European Green Deal as well. Um, the only thing that might be missing is the integrative part, that all of these eight priority areas and not leaving anybody behind and investments need to be also seen holistically from my view. So let me show you what the challenge is from my perspective. And we called it carbon law in a publication from a few years ago. And the reason why we called it carbon law is that if you have this vision where you want to be by 2050, namely net zero emissions, then what needs to be done is to half the emissions every year. So from 40 billion tons today to 20 billion tons by 2030, uh, and, and so on until we are close to net zero. And this is the gray area. Most of that heavy lifting has to happen in energy, but some of it, of course, in land use. But that's not enough. So there are three things here. One is to reduce the emissions. But the second problem is, and that's green and blue, is that the Mother Earth is kind to us. Uh, half of our emissions are being review, uh, uh, removed by the oceans and by the biosphere. And we are weakening that because we are threatening the earth, earth processes. So that's going to decline. That means we have to work even harder. And that's illustrated in almost all scenarios with a brown and yellow curve, namely try to generate net negative emissions. That's going to be very difficult. For example, carbon capture together with sustainable biomass, very difficult. But I prefer the nature-based solutions, which is more sustainable agriculture, afforestation, and leaving land to nature. So that's basically, uh, I think, the carbon law. And uh, in my view, it's reflected in the Fit for 55 legislation package in Europe. That has trouble all of a sudden. The negotiation, even though it's one year old, it's not there yet. But I hope it will be there. And below is the scientific opinion of the group of seven chief scientific advisors to the European Commission that I have a pleasure of sure. Uh, uh, serving on, and we published this energy transition in Europe, scientific opinion for the commissioners, also almost a year ago. And let me just share with you some of the conclusions from that work. So basically, we recommend, these are the, the high-level recommendations. There are many more detailed recommendations. Uh, our recommendation was to develop flexible, efficient, and resilient energy systems in order to deliver clean, accessible, and affordable energy services by integrating decarbonized energy sources, electrification is the key, but also hydrogen, probably blue at the beginning, but then green in the long run. But that cannot be done without the participation of all stakeholders and actors. So we argued strongly for a participatory process uh, to have everybody on, on board. And that, since we also say in the report, that the low carbon lifestyle should be the preferred lifestyle. Uh, if we don't achieve that, I don't think we will make the transition that's necessary. And for that, we'll need a coordinated set of policies, measures, and instruments, including carbon pricing. And that's one of the difficulties we have today. So that was our recommendation. And as you can see, in parallel, the Fit for 55 was developed. Um, as a part of the European Green Deal. And this is how the, the one of the trajectories for the uh, Fit for 55 looks like. You have uh, um, the, uh, the 
essentially the current emissions, halving them by 2030, perfectly consistent with the carbon law. And even here, you can see net negative emissions by 2050. So even in Europe, one of the visions is that we will not be able to do it without. I'm very skeptical how well that's going to work, but here we are, because we didn't act it when the Club of Rome published its first warning about the future. Now, this is from the IPCC, but there is a huge congruence that many, many reports go in this direction. Uh, what do we need to do? And I think that's relatively well known, what do we need to do? We should have picked the emissions already before. Should have already happened, did not happen. So that means that we need a very steep reduction of emissions to be carbon neutral by mid-century, and then these are net negative emissions in the long run. What does that require? Well, redirecting investments immediately, that's the key. Without investments, we are not going to re realize this future, in my view. Uh, power sector needs to be decarbonized, electrification of all land uses should be a priority, efficiency and sufficiency, and the land use. And here are some of the, uh, some of the recommendations, uh, uh, zero carbon electricity, electrified uses, low carbon fuels, carbon removal. So I will not go into the details, but this is the task ahead. And if you think that also India and China and all of the countries of the world need to do it, you, you can see how Herculean the effort would be. Here in Austria, and I'm sure Reinhardt will talk about that, uh, in Austria we have already the law for 100% um, uh, carbon-free electricity in place, but we don't have one for the other uses, which is, I think, really important if you're going to move in that direction. Um, and this figure I've borrowed from the uh, uh, Klimarate Burgerinnen that just completed its work. Uh, I think you're all familiar with that. I just showed it for, show it for the record, our emissions, uh, the yellow, have hovered between 80 and 90 million tons for decades. And the measures that we have in place will not get us where we need to go. Here is where we need to go. And whether it's an S-shaped pattern or a linear decline, I doubt that we can do it linearly because we didn't really start yet. But you can see how difficult that would be to be carbon neutral by, 20, by 2040. So it's a huge effort. But I believe that it's feasible. The question is, will we put our minds together to do it? And also at the global level, we have scenarios that go in that direction. Uh, and this is illustrated here. This is the work of my colleagues at IASA. It's so-called low energy demand scenario, where they look at the changes also in the structure of the energy demand. That will, it's very difficult to realize because we all have to do it, but it's a scenario. What would need to be done? How is a different issue? Um, and this scenario is one and a half degree scenario. But note, even that there might be different future ways of achieving this, this future, but in this particular case, what Emery Lovins called megawatts. Not produced electricity is more than half of what provides the demand, and the fossils slowly taper towards zero. Renewables play an important role, but efficiency and end use change is the key. Now, will this happen? Uh, well, here is my concern. This is from REN21. These are the investments in renewables worldwide modern renewables, about 300 billion per year, roughly speaking. Um, and look at the bar charts back where the arrows are um, 10 years ago. 10 years ago in Europe, we invested 123 billion in renewables. In, 90, in 2019, only one third of that. Okay, you can say it increased a year later by 50%. But I think we are very far of what needs to be done, and this is why I put the priority on investments before. And please note also the developing countries are investing even more. Maybe you can say this is really good news, but it does mean that we are not investing enough, and that on top of it comes the efficiency and many other measures. And why would this be important? I think because there are multiple benefits from that, as we know right now in the current crisis. This is the import dependency. That would be one huge benefit of avoiding large import dependency we have in Europe on the left. You can see almost 60% a few years ago, and that's where Austria is as well. We are also in the range of 60% import dependency. So with zero carbon energy options and investment in that direction, that would be a huge co-benefit. The other huge co-benefit, in my view, would be the fact 
that renewables in most places today are still cheaper than other competing energy sources. And uh, we shouldn't forget that, for example, if you look at the photovoltaics, the, we have decades of rapidly declining costs through technological learning at about 20% per doubling of the capacity worldwide. And I think that promises to continue in the future. So they are the cheapest now, but again, need, need investments. It won't happen by itself. So it's the same challenge, uh, but the benefit could be economic in the long run. If we can do this upfront investment, we could benefit from the low costs in the long run. So, and the third huge co-benefit is the elimination of the air pollution to a large extent that I mentioned worldwide costs about 8 million lives per year. So it's one of the greatest causes of death. So this is my penultimate slide. I wanted to leave some time later on for the discussion. I hope I've not gone through the material too quickly, but I wanted to share this is my favorite slide, to be honest, because I think that the pictures tell thousand words, much better than, than data and curves. So what you see here are five areas of human activities. Um, or services that railways provide, flying machines, telecommunication, individual mobility, and industrial processes. And whether you would pick another picture or not, let's put that to a side, I think you would agree that in periods of 50 years we made fundamental changes, really fundamental changes in all of those and other systems. These were really fundamental transformations in periods of five decades. And, um, I think what's also important is the vertical, not only horizontal, that all of the systems need to mesh together to provide the services that we need. And um, by 2050, they should be decarbonized. I, you know, I, nobody knows what the future will bring. I just put some pictures there that would be consistent with that, that might form a new zero energy system. All I'm trying to say is that I think it's not completely out of reach, even though we only have 30 years to get there. And let me then close by, um, uh, talking, saying a few words about the new European Bauhaus. I'm exceedingly enthusiastic about that as a way of implementing the European Green Deal. Uh, you know, the metaphor goes back to the Bau original Bauhaus 100 years ago. The new one would be completely different. But the idea is, in, in addition, as you can see in the three bullets, in addition to sustainability, which I think we all agree is really important, to have an inclusive society where everybody feels good and the aesthetic, the beautiful, is a very important part of it, and I think that's connected here to this hall. So maybe all of our buildings would be made out of sustainable wood, like here, in the future. What is really important is reuse and restructuring those systems. So I would like to stop here. Let me just share with you, uh, I see, okay, they are there. Um, that if you want to do some further reading, the two publications, uh, one, The World in 2050 here, we produced three reports on the transformation and the energy opinion for the European Commission from last year, both available on the website. So, thank you very much. I don't know if Reinhard, you go immediately or if you have questions at the end, no? Good afternoon. It's really a very great pleasure for me to be here today to see so many faces which are familiar to me, fighting together for a long time. And in my presentation, I have to announce now that I'm not as optimistic as Naki is. And Naki says we will make it in the next 30 years. And one reason why I'm not so optimistic is said, let's say, about eight years ago in Paris, we had promises, and at that time it was much easier to follow this phasing out curve of carbon. But what had happened in this period of time, I would say nothing has happened. There were a lot of hot air in the speeches, but finally there was not much really brought to the ground. This is my own PV system. Actually, it has already been replaced, repowered. I have installed it in 2002, and it was one of the first at that time in Austria. Today, I will shortly repeat introduction motivation. 
energy in Austria, electricity. I will look at transport, industry, and buildings, and then explain how we can, in principle, decarbonize the energy system. Potentials of renewables in Austria and the possibilities for hydrogen will, with the conclusions, complete my presentation. First, I would like to start to discuss why are we here today? We are here today if we compare our style of life with the medieval age 500 years ago, we simply have much more energy and high quality available. And energy is, turn it as you like, the fundamental of our standard of life today. And all of you, every second of our life, even if we sleep deeply, we consume energy. And this has, over time, brought about a dramatic increase in energy consumption in the recent years. And for the future, it is currently still expected that energy demand will grow. But we have at least the opportunity to decide from which sources we take. I am the academic director of this postgraduate course here at Technical University of the ACE. And in this postgraduate course, we try to show and to teach how to switch to renewable energy systems. One basic question here was, and this is my only international part, how much energy do we need? Wie viel Energie braucht der Mensch? And here we can see that it depends how much energy a man, a woman needs. For example, in the USA, it's about 80,000 kilowatt hours per capita. In Austria, it's about half, it's about 45,000 kilowatt hours per capita. And in sub-Saharan Africa, it's only 4,000 kilowatt hours per capita, that is to say, less than 10% of Austrian consumption. But what is also of interest in this picture is that the green areas show transport. And transport is largest, by far largest, in the United States. The, let's say, magenta areas show industry, and if you look at Sub-Sahara, there is no transport, there is no industry, they just try to survive. Okay, last slide to the international one, electricity per capita. Here we have Austria. Here we have Norway, that is to say Norway has a little bit more, almost twice, almost three times as Austria. And again, we can actually see here an even more different picture than we have seen for overall energy. Let's look back, energy in Austria. In the 1980s, we had growth rates of three to 4% per year. And you see at least this has changed. In this slide, we have the red hedged area is oil, and we have at least hold our oil consumption constant. Yellow natural gas has overall slightly increased over time, and on the top we have green, the biomass and other renewables. And I would say we are lucky that at least since about 10, 15 years, we have a stagnation in primary energy. This is not the ultimate target, but it's better than the still continuing growth of the past. If we just look at the renewable energy, we can see that we have in the meantime about 35% reached last year. It was not just due to the corona crisis, First major source was maybe surprisingly here hydropower. Maybe some have expected that we have relied on biomass much earlier, but then the biomass development came about 
and in the last years on the top the yellow hatched areas is from the new renewables. Naki has already mentioned the issue of imports, so I do not repeat it. We have 60% or 67% even import of our energy. Electricity in Austria. Looking back at the history of electricity in Austria, this is the most important slide. Germany announced the Energiewende in 2011. We have announced the Energiewende in 1978 when we were facing out by vote, facing out of nuclear power. Now we see here in this slide how the electricity generation in Austria developed. And you see blue here is the hydropower. We have here thermal fossil fuels. This is now green, green energy from wind and from photovoltaics and biomass. And on the top we have imports. On the bottom we have the exports. That might be of interest and surprising because I have learned at the university Austria is an export country. We export electricity to our neighbor countries. This has obviously changed. Demand has been still going to about up to 2005, but afterwards it was a rather moderate, and these are the so-called imports. I will show a little bit later where these imports come from. In 2020, we had this effect here of a reduction of overall electricity demand. Of course, this was due to Corona, and Dr. Losch has already announced that we have to think about how demand will develop for electricity, and this is really one of our key issues. One very important aspect is set on the margin today with respect to electricity. We do not have excess electricity from renewables. In most single hours of the year, every additional kilowatt hour of electricity is generated from fossil fuels. Without emotions, if you buy an electric vehicle, regardless Naki whether it's, it's yours or it's an electric vehicle of somebody else, if this individual does not have a serious contract for renewable electricity, these kilowatt hours will come from fossil fuels. And also, if you add heat pumps to our system today, most of this electricity will be produced in Austrian natural gas power plants, in German lignite power plants, or in Czech nuclear power plants. So no excess electricity from renewables exists, except maybe 26th of October, where we have our national holiday, and usually there is a lot of wind, and the same is for the Germans when they have their reunification day. Dr. Roche has already mentioned our target. Naki has already also focused on it, that we want to have 100% electricity by the year 2030. And this slide shows a possible pathway to reach this target. This figure also shows the black line, which is our load. And here we have historical data until about 2018. On the bottom, we have photovoltaic and wind as as announced, the major, additional, the major additional sources. Here we have natural gas. So natural gas was already planned before to have some phase out. We will not, in our calculations, really come to zero. It is also the question how much biomass in form from biogas we can 
implement into the system. And we have to cover and meet this import gap. I have already mentioned today in the last years we have imported a lot of electricity because it was simply cheap, cheaper than to produce it by ourselves. The corresponding capacity for this scenario up to 2030 is shown here. So we have much more capacity from PV and wind as we have seen in the energy picture, simply because we do not produce so many full load hours electricity by these technologies, but in total we will come up to about 40 gigawatt by the year 2030. The corresponding monthly electricity generation and demand is now shown here in this slide. And we see that in summertime, some long-term storage is needed. And this long-term storage could be, for example, hydrogen. It can be maybe methane. It can also be any other power to X technology, maybe even products can be made from this excess electricity. But be in mind this picture, in the winter months we will have just the advantage that something is in a balanced way used from the summer months. Austria and its neighbors in the electricity system, I have already mentioned, we have a lot of imports. And in real life, we import from two countries physically and from one country, we can say, by means of contacts. It is clear, red imports from Germany and from Czech Republic. From Czech Republic, some say we do not do it voluntarily. It's because Germany shifts its electricity via Czech Republic to Austria. But this is the situation as a matter of fact. We have just to recognize that we say we do not like the Czech nuclear energy, but we will physically import some. What is a very important aspect in this whole development is the infrastructure. There is a discussion on the infrastructure of natural gas to be used by hydrogen, but maybe this is done a little bit later also in the discussion. And this is a situation for electricity. So we have here major projects of the Austrian power grid for the next years. Do you think it's easy to build these additional lines? Of course, it's very expensive, but money is not the problem. And again, without emotions, there is resistance against these lines. And some of you know this phrase of not in my backyard. That is to say, we want to have all amenities possible from using energy and electricity-based services, but we do not really like to have the corresponding infrastructure. Next is mobility transport. It's the worst sector. This is the share of oil products over time. We had a almost unlimited growth up to about the years 2005. We can say, fortunately, afterwards, also in this slide, some stagnation is recognizable. And in recent decades, since about 2005, we also have implemented biofuels. We have blended our diesel and our gasoline already in the refinery by means of these biofuels. Blue is electricity electricity mainly from public transport. 
That is to say, if we discuss electric mobility, I think it is really very important to point out that this is, has in the past mainly been used for the public transport. In recent years, there was also additional electricity from cars. In the scenarios I have shown up to 2030, we have also done some sensitivity analysis. Up to 2030, we will not have significant problems with additional electricity, but afterwards, if we really extend the shares, we might have to take into account how to do it. If we think about alternatives in transport, I think it is important to recognize that we do not have zero emission technologies. In this slide, you can see the 30% savings are possible if we switch to bioethanol as a fuel. On the right side, you can see that even 70% are possible if we switch to battery electric or fuel cell vehicles, by and large. But we will not come to zero, and this is more or less applying for all changes. We have to invest in infrastructure, we have to use CO2 for building up infrastructure, and that delays the overall CO2 saving balance. And I think this could also be an interesting point for the discussion afterwards. Next is industry. It has already very good been described by Dr. Losch. She has told us what are the problems in industry and where we have to head for. If we look in the, at the past, we can see three major developments. First is Oil phasing out, coal phasing out, we can say, has been achieved. But we can also see here, this is the natural gas part. And here we had the largest increase over the last, we can say, 20 years. One other positive aspect is that also in industry, stagnation is prevailing since about 15 years Next, the households, I have added here this special slide on overall household consumption, especially because here we see that natural gas is actually modest. We cannot say it is not important, but it is shown with a specific share and we have some diversification. We have done for the heating sector a study called Wärmewende 2050. And in this study, we have, based on the historical developments, tried to show what is possible by means of improving energy efficiency for the buildings. That is to say, improving the building outdoor walls and windows quality and so on. And how can we reach 100% renewables? Actually, we would have expected that in the year 2018, when we have done the study, already a significant uh, backlash go down of the energy consumption would take place. Now we hope that it will take place in a delayed way. But by 2050, we will then have different fractions of biomass, pellets, pellets and the wood chips, solid wood, and also district heat, as well as solar thermal. Basic principle is, here you see red is total heating energy demand, and green is the share of renewables, the part of renewables. If we would have business as usual, then total heating demand would increase further, and only if we manage to bring about 
an improvement of the thermal efficiency of the building in a significant way, we can really increase the share of the renewables. For the future, decarb of the energy system. How can we do it? So I have seen here different students of mine from now, from former times. We have here Professor Nakicenovic, who was teaching with me about 10 years. So let's start with some basic equations. We have, in principle, our service demand is energy times efficiency. We have CO2 emissions, a CO2 factor times energy, and the final equation of mankind, you can say, is CO2 is the CO2 factor times service demand divided by the efficiency. We also have to take into account embedded energy. I have already mentioned it. FCO2 can be changed by a switch to renewable energy. The service demand can be changed by structure, behavior. If we have a tax, service demand for driving with the car would probably go down. And last, here we have improved the efficiency ETA. We can improve the efficiency of the car, the heating stove, the boilers, the overall building envelope. These are the three major possible strategies, measures. And we can do it by means of intrusive, introducing policies. I call it the policy triangle. We can implement policy standards, for example, for the building envelope. We can introduce some way of carbon pricing, a carbon tax, emission trading systems, and we can introduce subsidies, for example, subsidies for improving the efficiency, subsidies for switching to renewable electricity as we already had it. And then we can try to harvest the potential of renewable energy in Austria. These are four potential studies by different Austrian authors, and they have been in this documented in this Sachstandsbericht we had, was it 2014? And I have now tried to see what is the current situation. So here, the red line shows the current primary energy demand in Austria. We have, from my point of view, currently the following potentials, which also include what has been mentioned before regarding the 2030 targets, wind, PV, and hydro up to 2030. This is hydro in petajoule. This is wind, about 80 petajoule. We have photovoltaics. The biomass from agriculture. In this scenario, we have assumed that also arable land is to some extent used for growth of renewables. We have the biomass from the forest, wood, and we have biomass residuals. On the top, this is ambient heat to be used for heat pumps, and finally up to 2050, maybe some more or less large part of geothermal. So actually, my colleague Wolfgang Streicher from Innsbruck has done this estimation years ago, and he was rather in favor of this use of ambient heat and geothermal things. I would like here to point out one specific issue now. It's called Schadstoffmengen, and it goes under the category here, res residues. That is to say, today we have in the Austrian forests still a lot of biomass which is not optimal used, and this could be done in the discussion on the green gases. So in Austria, in recent, let's say, months, different 
Studies have popped up who promote the use of green gases from different origin, and one is from this special biomass residues. And the reason why it is not used is because it is too expensive to build up the refinery for this biomass sources. I come to, I think, one of the maybe currently most controversial topics, and it's the use of hydrogen. I have already said we can use the excess electricity in summer months to produce green hydrogen. The European Union has already in 2003 set up this vision of a hydrogen-based energy system. They have also in 2003 introduced a roadmap. Unfortunately, from this roadmap up to 2020, not many targets has so far been met. It is also important to say we have different types of hydrogen. Main colors of hydrogen as shown here. We can do it from natural gas with or without CO2 capture. But of course, our favorite color here is currently green. Green electricity from electrolysis of the renewable energy sources. From my point of view, it is first important to say that there is no zero emission technologies. I have mentioned it for transport, but it applies universally. And also hydrogen, green hydrogen is not purely zero emission. Next is we have some modest efficiency in the change of the hydrogen use because we have the efficiency of the electrolyzer if it's 70%, it's 30% less as of electricity. And in Austria, we have at least a discussion, will we just use purely green hydrogen, which has rather low full load hours, or will we go into gray hydrogen taken from just electricity from the grid? And another point is, import of green hydrogen for, from the MENA countries, as has already been announced. But here we can also think about, isn't it better to use the green electricity produced in the North African countries directly for their own electricity use? I understand that it's also for these countries attractive to make good business with Europe in the, content, in the context of this hydrogen trade. But I think this could be, and it has been announced in the program, also one of the major points of the following panel discussion. Two studies on hydrogen. In, for Austria, we have estimated about seven terawatt hours, which could be a potential up to 2050. And for the overall EU, we have set up from different studies shown here, that we could have by 2050 about 400 terawatt hours. Last slide, my conclusions. First, as said, there is no zero emission technology. If we want to reduce the carbon emissions, this, it is not easy and there is no one sits far size fits for all approach. And we have to accept that flexibility in the overall system is much more needed in future than it has been in the past. As said, biomass, green gases, of course there are also potentials of other sources, but this is, from my point of view, an untapped potential, but needs investment support. As been shown, the potential of renewables in Austria is limited. It might be more that I have presented, but finally it will also be limited and it will also be accompanied by, let's say, environmental unfriendly aspects. 
One very important aspect is banana. I have shown before in another way, but banana means the acceptance is not here. Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anybody. Finally, I think education is a very important aspect. We have our course here at TU Wien, ACE, and I make some ads for it. And you have also the folders regarding this course. We have co-organized this event today. And of course, one additional aspect that has to be taken into account is the issue of money. We need a lot of money for investments, for example, in the photovoltaic plants, also in the wind power plants, in the rebuild of the grid structure, infrastructure. And we have to find a way how, where from we get this money. It's also in the responsibility of the regulatory authority. Thank you for your attention. time. Um, I wonder whether there are some ad hoc questions to the two professors right now or whether we should just have a short break of the uh, five to ten minutes and then start uh, as foreseen in the program with the panel debate and include the, the audience. I think that if there's not a there immediate is, question then we, there is no question. we do it like this. This was a lot of information uh, I think so I think it's, it's, it's reasonable to have to have the short break and to, to start uh, rather punctually with the debate. Yeah? Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Difficult task. As you, as you can read in the program, how do we implement the energy transition in practice? Naki has already told us what needs to be done, was his part. How is a different issue. We now come to this how. And Reinhard has told us, well, there is no net, there is no zero emissions technology and he's very skeptical on whether we can achieve that. So in this spectrum of we know what needs to be done, very difficult, how to get there. Our task now is how do we implement the energy transition in practice in a way that we come to net zero emissions as early as possible and as the Austrian government seeks to achieve by 2040. And to that end, I may introduce a very interesting panel to you and I start from my far end. Hildegard Eichberger, she's board member of Ökostrom AG she has her background in her training in technical construction, cultivation, water management, biotechnology firm. Then, it, then she worked in environmental NGOs that where we first met in Mutter Erde, for example. She was the managing director. Then in the social sector, Caritas in the uh, top management. And then she moved to a very interesting company uh, that Ökostrom AG that arose 1999 out of the anti-nuclear and climate protection movement. There is a few thousand shareholders by now and they are the largest independent energy supplier in Austria. And yeah, also there is currently an expansion. They are offering shares at the moment. They have a capital extension. So it's in the final days as I understand. So if you're interested, take a look on the web and uh, get familiar with the rising chances of an institute that benefits or takes advantage, I think, of the Austrian energy um, at extension law as well. To her left, there is uh, Peter Eiler. He is the head of the local hydrogen production in Verbund, the Austrian Verbund. He has a background in strategic management, both at the Vienna University of Economics and Business and at Singapore Management University. And then um, 
he worked for Verbund Corporate Development and Strategy and moved on to hydrogen. So this is the issue that Reinhard mentioned at the end. We can, one of the expertises we need for hydro hydrogen is the pro production of hydrogen. To his left, uh, Theresia Vogel, Managing Director of the Klima and Energie Fonds. She has also a technical background, but also a business background, and then was in applied research funding, structural programs, and now for quite a time running the most central, well, both in practical dissemination, but also in research, Klima und Energie Fonds. Uh, to her left, uh, Siegfried Kiss, He's the head of business development at RAC Austria, Rohöl Aufsuchungsgesellschaft. No, renewable and gas now, but that was the initial name. Okay, so also linking to your background in petroleum in engineering in Leoben, um, but for 17, then in, in uh, the construction industry and now for 17 years in RAC. Uh, renewable and gas, and this is uh, one of the largest companies in Europe on gas storage. So we really have a very uh, a diamond here in, 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 in Austria in that area, which is a crucial, uh, of crucial relevance in a renewable energy system. And to my right, um, Judith Neyer, Director of the Strategic Energy Policy in the Climate uh, Ministry. She's a political scientist by training then worked at the international level, then in Austrian parliament on the in, in environmental issues, and then in research and spatial energy planning um, for the heat transition in Vienna. And since end of last year, mid, since, oh, the start of the war. since the start of, okay, since end of February, she is now um, uh, director of strategic energy policy. So if we want, to go somewhere for this energy transition. It helps to have a picture that is not too different. There is so many actors, we have been aware of them in the two presentations by both Naki and Reinhardt. And one of my fears is, is there enough space, enough fora, enough uh, processes in Austria that we get this common picture, that, can, that we can negotiate this common picture? And I wonder where you see what are the necessary steps to come to a common picture in Austria, where should we go? And this refers to infrastructure. Which infrastructure, where, when do we need? We have seen hydrogen needs infrastructure, electricity needs in infrastructure. So my first question would be, and uh, this is one question to really all, all of you, what do you see as crucial elements in this process to get to a common picture in Austria, in our society, within Europe? But let's focus on Austria. And I start um, on that with Mr. Eiler, please. I think, um, first of all, thank you for the introduction and invitation. Um, um, I am one of Reinhard Hart's former students, so. Um, clearly didn't point me out and we had many discussions during the time um, and in that sense I would say that I think we have to get rid of the bananas as you called it um, we built any, absolutely nothing anything anywhere around anybody um, I think we get we have to try to find the best solutions with all technologies like you said um, there's no zero carbon technology uh, we need to think the whole system and um, we need to yeah, resolve all those social and, and political conflicts we have. It's not a technical issue, it's more like you said, it's yeah. a, it's a, you have to get together in the discussions and the solution finding. Do you see for, do you see places where this discussion takes place, where you from Verbund, for example, are invited and can really ne negotiate and de discuss with others? Uh, do, do we have such fora in Austria? Discussions happen at, at many levels, at many places. Maybe, maybe too many. Maybe we have to pull everything more, and more together to come to one solution. Um, but I think that's that's a very, very big challenge. We, okay. I have no solution for that. So. Yeah. Thanks, Ms. Eichberger. Okay. Um, 
maybe if I if I may go back one step, um, referring to I think I think it was the first presentation we had. Uh, I think there are a lot of places where where we can discuss this, but I think that the problem is that we we are not yet aware how uh, the the time challenge that we have and that we face. And we've seen it in, in this first presentation when we saw the, those, when we rem remembered the curve and we saw where we are heading at. And then we saw where do we have this S curve where we should go. And I think this is something we, in, in all the panels and all the institutions and all the discussions, uh, I don't feel this sense of urgency, this uh, spirit of crisis that we that we would need. I'm not I'm not here to now to to, to talk about uh, the consequences of climate change, but I think if we want to tackle this challenge, we need another modus now because we are not in the 80s when we talk about when the boundaries will be uh, reached uh, in 50 years, but we but it is in seven years. That was a study of you, uh, Professor Steininger. Uh, the carbon budget is, is, is finished, so we don't have any more, uh, we, we may not emit any more carbon to the, to the atmosphere because the, then we, we, we come over these 1.5 degrees. And when, this, when I come back to energy, what does this mean? I think we do have the institutions, but we really need to change our modus of talking about it. We have to be more bold about it and more serious about it. And we've seen this in Corona that we can do that. Um, and uh, I think we can do it, just do it in, in the discussions that we have. But uh, we need to, you know, to go this one step further. And, and the second, I think, dogma that we need to bring into these discussions, which would really help, is that the time of cheap energy uh, is over. And it's over not only during the Ukraine uh, war, but it has to be over for the future because energy is something which is really rare and it is, uh, we will talk about hydrogen then, it's valuable and it's rare. Uh, and we, we need this investment security also for the future that we know that the times of, of, of cheap energy are over and uh, that's why our, bus our businesses and our uh, corporations have to develop in another direction. That's the two points I wanted to make prior to, to this discussion because I really think it's very important to talk about this uh, approach that we take and not so much about, I think the people are there, the, the competences are there, but we need another approach to this issue. Thanks a lot. So some external shocks really help us. The price is one of them. Mr. Kiss, when you think of, when you consider your system and know what infrastructure there is needed, is there enough common sharing of this picture in Austria? Well, probably uh, I start with uh, some greetings from my CEO, Markus Mitteger, because he's not able to come today to the meeting or to the, to the presentations because he has to work pretty hard these days. Why? Because we need security of supply and since we are one of the largest storage providers, technical storage providers for Austria and Germany, we have a lot to do in these days as you can, can see. And if I go, go, go back and, and would like to, to answer the question, I see Professor Nakitsimovic. We, are, we know each other since years, decades actually, and we are following his pathways. He presented back in 1978. This was the, the presentation, the paper of the evolution of energy carriers. And that was clear for us that the energy carriers from solids like coal to oil and the gases energy carriers, there is a transformation path. And this transformation path is still our story of our company as well. You introduced the, our company's Rohöl Aufsuchung. Yes, back in the 1930s, we started with oil because oil was an energy carrier. It was available in Austria. And the question about oil, there was no question about storage of oil. If you go to gaseous uh, energy carriers, you have to think about gas storages. You have to think how can you fulfill demand in the winter days? bring in 
the, the less demand from, from some of these. And we followed the transformation from oil to gas. We are now the gas storage company. And since 15 years, we started the concept of power to gas. Nobody thought about power to gas. Professor Nakitimaj, we, we talked quite a lot and we were quite alone in this. And what we realized is that even you're transforming to electricity, you need an energy carrier, you need the molecules. And we started since then to do a lot of research, how can we store electricity and bringing the summer sun to the winter demand. And this is our main goal, what we are facing. We are dealing with hydrogen storages and do a lot of research on that. And we think that's the most cru crucial infrastructure for the future to have security of supply in Austria, in Europe, because as uh, Reinhardt uh, also uh, uh, told us, we need to import a lot of energy also in future. Thanks, we'll come to hydrogen in the next question, but I want to uh, finish off this round with two questions. So your, one of your answers was, there is science, there is a pathway, and we can just follow it. Ms. Vogel, um, is science supplying enough, or are the pictures supplied by science shared by society and policymakers? Do they have enough power? Do we need more to negotiate them to agree on them? Um, yeah, good afternoon or evening. <laughs> uh, I was, during the last weeks, I was uh, participating at several events and several conferences talking about the energy transition, talking about the, the new world of energy. And at least uh, I think society is, is ready to move. People are aware of, of there has to be a kind of transition. Uh, people are aware of that. People are on the way because if I look, for example, the Climate and Energy Fund is giving funding to people, also to private households for the rollout, for example, of small-scale PV installations on their rooftops. And we have now given funding for more than 100,000 of these uh, plants, of these mini plants. So people are aware. We have more than, close to more than 100,000 of uh, electric vehicles now, so people are willing to go that way. But at least I think th from my perspective and what I can see during the last years also, this is the point that energy transition as well as the, um, as the climate crisis should be a common topic of all political parties all over the country as well as all over Europe. And this is right now not the case. We still have debate between right and left and I don't know green and others. Yeah. So if we want to go forward faster, and it's a debate of time, scale and money, if we want to go forward faster, we have to close the rows and to go into one direction is the first thing and not talk of many, many, many details sometimes. Yeah. So it's really like that. The people are willing to follow and I think this common picture is, is becoming more and more clearer to all of us. And even the role of, of storage. I mean, uh, if we would have talked 10 years ago, uh, no, people would say, why, why do we need storage? We have gas 24 seven. Yeah? So the, the picture is becoming clearer. And I think we're talking of a big disruption in our systems. And I think the first step has to be on the political level stay together, make a national, make a continental project out of it. This is the most important. And then give the picture, give a good picture. It's about climate communication. Tell the truth, develop a desirable picture of the future and show the way and offer support. So you really sense already this common picture in the population, but you see that it's not yet reflected enough on a policy level. I would agree on a yeah, on the meta level. I would meta agree level. to that theory. Okay, yeah. Let's move Judith to policy. Um, you have observed policy from various oh, thanks, yeah, elements, from the perspective of parliament and from research, and now in the ministry, in the climate min ministry. What would you see as is there a picture already clear enough, or what could be elements that we 
get to a common picture. Yes, thank you also for having me. It's wonderful to see people in real life again. I'm also going to note that you've put us in really comfortable chairs here uh, on the panel, and I think this is because you're asking us really hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> and it's working. <laughs> so, um, so is there a picture that's already clear enough? And, and from a policy perspective, what are the most important steps? Um, well, I think sort of the one thing that on the panel has been mentioned before, and then also our keynote speakers and also in the welcoming words from Michi Losch, uh, you spoke with great authority about the issue of timing, um, or basically that we have no time. So uh, time is of the essence, I think that is clear. And this is a little bit what will shape the picture, I think, which is ever evolving because we had known, you also spoke to that with great clarity. We have known what needs to be done and what lies ahead of us for a very long time and we haven't acted. Yeah? So we now need to act faster. And, and this means, on, from a policy and planning perspective, we need to shift, I think, to a new uh, transition level. What we've done well so far, and this, I think, has become really clear in uh, Reinhard Haas's presentation, is that we've Done, we've built up the elements of what we need and we've really excelled at that and it needs to be said and pointed out. So we've built up new technologies at a mind gobbling pace. Uh, we've seen elect renewable electricity go from a fringe hippie idea to just our sort of life-saving solution basically and we've seen costs come down. So that is all there. Um, but I think we now need to shift to a whole system perspective because we have the different elements and we're not putting the parts of the puzzle together. And why are we not doing that? Because it hurts, yeah? Because this is really when we need, when we start changing. And change is always hard. So I think what does this mean sort of in more concrete terms? I think we need from a policy system perspective, we need to tackle new things. We need to t tackle heat, which we've neglected. Uh, and I mean low temperature heat and also high temperature heat, obviously, which, will we, speak, which will, we will be speaking more about today because we're speaking about hydrogen as well. So we need to tackle heat. We need to uh, have answers to, for, for when the sun don't shine. Yeah? So we need to speak about storage. We need to speak about sector coupling. Um, and there, again, we need to speak about the medium that goes between gaseous energy carriers and electricity, and that is hydrogen. Not only hydrogen, we also need to speak about efficiency uh, so, so urgently, because we've seen in all of the charts that were up here tonight that it's not gonna work unless we really, really bring down our energy demand. And we can, because we're wasting energy, yeah? And then I think the last thing that we really need to, to speak about as well, and that's the elephant in the room in many of these discussions, is we need to shut down dirty capacity. Because we cannot leave these things running in parallel, because that's, that's when you start to put the picture together, that's not gonna work anymore, yeah? So, so I think this big picture, that is there, and I think the elements were pretty clear to a lot of, um, a lot of also the broader public. Uh, Theresa Fugel, you pointed out that you feel like this, 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 I don't know, a wave building up, and there's so much more knowledge out there, but I think we still need to work on bringing this all together into one, one picture. Um, and, and, and so I'll just go to one more sentence, please, because it's so important, because what it also needs, it, it, it needs is that um, we always, we used to say it takes a wartime effort um, to do this. And, and I thought maybe that's because I, I started this position a week before the war started in Ukraine. So maybe I'm just also personally a little bit shaken by this still. But I think this is what's happening now. Yeah, it's a wartime effort. We're finally in it. We're also in it when it comes to diversification fossil routes, yeah, and we're, we're sort of now struggling uh, to, to try and, and, and secure resilience and energy security, and, and we're putting a lot of work into this. And I think the, the other important element that it needs, this has to feed into the energy transition, yeah. All of what we're doing to get away from Russian gas has to feed into the climate agenda, and if we fail to do this, then I really don't know what I'm going to say on the next panel in five years' time. Thanks. So it's really 
a big picture now, this consistent overall picture, not only the elements, and let's tackle some of these questions. And I would like to pick out two. One is hydrogen, the role of hydrogen. Reinhard has asked us this, this at the end for this panel, and the second is on the demand side. And on hydrogen, maybe Mr. Eiler and Mr. Kiss again, and on the demand side, um, Ms. Leichberg and, and uh, Vogel and Judith, yeah, please. Um, it's always good to have a producer talk about the demand side, so we can all um, name our wishes. And, and, and oh yeah, you, you can um, then also talk on the demand let me start, side. We restarted yeah. our hydrogen journey back in 2016 when we Siemens, so, and what is the role of hydrogen? What are the factors that determine the role of hydrogen? Yeah. Well, just to get it back to the, the, the areas where we need hydrogen and, and what, where we think we need hydrogen. Mm -hmm. We started in the steel industry when we talked to, to First Alpine and Siemens about our um, project in, in Linz, the H2 Future plant, which was, I think, the world's biggest PEM electrolyzer back in 2019. We lost that title, unfortunately, but it's also a good thing because the developments are going on and on. Um, so steel is one, but probably not the first one for before 2030. Um, but there is every every application of hydrogen or current application of hydrogen as a molecule is the one we have to tackle first. I think that's pretty the same picture that we see in the hydrogen strategy that was published two weeks ago. Um, so that's that's basically the petrochemical industry, that's the fertilizer industry, um, that's the, the the first things I think we we should tackle. Um, then we already heard, um, then we have um, high temperature processes. Um, there's not so many alternatives. For low temperature, we see more, more direct electrification. Of course, as an electricity company, it's also a very good option. Um, and um, then we see a lot of process imminent uh, CO2 emissions that do not really demand hydrogen from themselves, but we need to use the, the CO2 emissions we cannot get rid of as a feedstock for all the, um, the applications where hydrogen is a molecule or, for example, the mobility um, industry um, is, is not the right solution. And that's, that's a tricky question, maybe we can come back, uh, come back to this one later. And what did I miss? Um, yeah, in the steel industry, of course, um, coming back to, to First Alpine, I think they have a, a huge hydrogen demand if they switch from the current, um, from the current production route to, to um, direct reduction via electric arch furnaces. Uh, I think Mr. Mr. Kainerstorff from First Opinion said once we need electricity of, I think it was 25 terawatt hours, that's the complete Danube, more than the complete Danube production in our hydropower plant. So before we start digging a second Danube in Austria, we should come up with better solutions for that. What will be the decisive determinants whether we do this in Austria, whether we produce hydrogen in Austria, or should we import it from abroad? I mean, it's the, the capacity of, of renewable energy we can install in Austria. I mean, we have a plan in the Neubahn Ausbau Gesetz that says plus 27 terawatt hours of, of electricity. Um, I think we, we see, but please please correct me, um, because I'm talking about your hydrogen transition. <laughs> we have, we have a, a target of um, about 100,000 tons of hydrogen until 2030. Um, I think that is, it's possible to do this with local production. But um, when, I, um, when I look at the scenario after 2030, we see, and that's also slightly referencing in, in the hydrogen um, uh, strategy, and we see 20, 16 to 25 terawatts of hydrogen, just pure hydrogen use. And if you apply the, the efficiency rate, Reinhard has talked about, of 60%, um, then we end up at, I don't know, about 25 to 40 terawatt hours of electricity. And I don't think we can double our targets of 27 terawatt hours within the next 10 years. So that's where we really have to think about um, getting the, the energy demand. If you don't get the service level down, we need to get the energy right. somewhere else. Right, that's the crucial issue that our electricity demand might rise by more than the 27 terawatt hours extra will give us to just close the gap, yeah? beyond just closing the gap. But before we come to demand, let's stick to hydrogen. Um, what would you see as the crucial points for Austria to determine how much of hydrogen we should produce here? For me, it, it, it's a clear picture. And uh, Reinhard also showed us 
we need roughly 400 terawatt hours of total energy demand. And what we target in these days is to get from 50 something additional 27. So we are below 100. So we are missing 300 plus. Because what we also saw is that our, let's say, demand is not increasing, but also not decreasing. It's stabilized, more or less at the 400 terawatt level, or terawatt hours level. I agree we have to improve efficiency, but still we, we do that since years. And so I'm not quite sure if we can come down to the 50% which is targeted. I always ask, what if, if not? So the, the domestic production of hydrogen will be limited because we need all the, the renewables already in the electric, electrical sector. So to, to balance the electricity system, yes, we will install quite significant amount of, of probably one gigawatt or two gigawatt to stabilize, to balance the energy, the, the, the electricity system. And so we have to think about how to get to the right numbers for the, the, the energy demand. And so we have to think about where do hydrogen come from in future or renewable, so let's say transformed into molecules to stabilize the energy system in the winter days. Because that's, that's the key issue. If you live not at the equator, you'll be living north of them. And uh, what we did, and we looked, and we have a lot of um, relationship to Germany in these days. Because Germany has a clear vision how to import significant amount of hydrogen. They have a program, it's called H2 Global. H2 Global means the government of Germany really provides significant amount of money for getting hydrogen from all over the world to form alliances starting from Chile, Australia, MENA regions, uh, NEOM projects, all, all wherever you can get. And we thought, well, we are a country, we don't have access to a big sea. We don't have harbors where we can import. And so we installed two years ago already an alliance with Ukraine. Because Ukraine has huge, uh, huge countryside where you can install renewables because also for the transition of their system. And it's pretty near what we see nowadays. It's less than 500, roughly 500 kilometers only away from Vienna. And there is an existing infrastructure for, from, from, from uh, uh, methane. And what we realized also is that there's not only one line. There are six parallel lines coming from Ukraine to Austria. And as uh, I'm not sure if, if Reinhardt mentioned it as well, that uh, you need 100% hydrogen as well. You have a transition period, but at the end, probably the steelmaker, like first, needs 33 terawatt hours of hydrogen. That's huge. And where does that come from? And we thought, okay, the infrastructure is there. You have converted. It's, it's not, not already here. Yes, it's feasible to transform it. And if you have six lines in parallel, you easily can transform the first. And then you, 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 you have access to a huge country. Unfortunately, yes, there is the war. But there will be a time after the war as well. And what we get a lot of signals because our, our project is called H2U plus store and we don't care if it is only from Ukraine but we have a significant amount that we will need 40, 50 terawatt hours coming from this region to, to Austria in form of hydrogen. So this is our clear picture.
touch on that. And hydrogen, I can talk quite a lot, but I think. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the very specific um, picture we now have in our minds. So you mentioned 400 um, terawatt hours we have in Austria as a total energy demand. And we need to focus on the demand side. I will, would like to ask Ms. Vogel now um, how to get a grips on the demand side, how, how, how to deal with the demand side. I mean, there is one area where, where we're lucky that in transport, when you shift from uh, petro, there we have an efficient uh, a degree of 19% only, and to, to um, electricity, we have more than 90% efficiency. So there we really have a large efficiency gain, even though, of course, shifting to e-mobility alone won't solve the transport problems. But all the other areas, how can we really tackle and what, what, what are the most crucial levers to, to deal with the demand side? Um, what we see, as a, let me say, this, this topic of efficiency, and I, I think Reinhard has mentioned it, is not the most attractive topic uh, uh, in Austria at present. Everyone is talking about it, but at least if I look to our projects, funding projects from our side, then I see that efficiency is not the big topic there, except uh, in, in big uh, enterprises of the, on, the, on the, of, of the energy intensive industry where the, where the price of energy is very important. And more or less the same is to smaller enterprises, if the price uh, or the costs of energy are very important, then they are attracted to do something ab about it. This is the one thing. What I see at, at present is not on the demand side, but on the supply side more or less. We have a big shift also to people generating their own energy, local energy in energy communities as well as in other uh, aggregations. And what we see there is not only producing energy, but also about how to deal with my own energy and how to deal with the local use of the produced, of the local produced energy. And this is also an effect on the, on the demand side, at least. Because they start thinking of how can I, how can I use it, how can I store it, and, and how can I improve the system. And so it starts. Yeah? But at least efficiency is not that big topic. We see in the innovation sector that efficiency is an, an indirect, uh, is, is involved in projects when they are dealing with le using less material for aggregates or for technologies, using cheaper materials, and at least also in, uh, boosting the efficiency of new technologies. But at least, sad to say, the efficiency topic or the demand side topic is a little bit ignored. How is it in, in the policy area? There we go. I'm glad you phrased the question so openly. Thanks, Carl, because I really wanted to talk about hydrogen as well. Um, but I'm going to try and, and draw the line to the efficiency issue because we've moved on a little bit. I am going to talk about hydrogen though because um, as Michi Losch has mentioned, it is, our house has published, the, our house together with the um, Ministry for Economy has published the uh, hydrogen strategy two weeks ago. And it was, um, I can talk about it, I'm, I'm really, I'm a big fan of the strategy. I can talk about it without blushing, although it was written in my department because most of the work was done before I arrived, so this is not self-praise. Um, I think what we, what, so on, on the numbers, on the figures, why are, we, why are we asking ourselves how much do we need? I mean, there's different, there's different ways of looking at this. One is obviously the overall supply of hydrogen and what will be needed in Austria. How much, we, how much will we produce all of this in Austria? No. I mean, no way. Uh, that's not going to happen. Um, but it's still really important that we put in an ambitious target, uh, I think, in the strategy, because what is the other reason why we need to look at the figures? We're, we're part of a really, really dynamic market, and, and we're part of a dynamic economy, and hydrogen is going to be one of the fuels of this, yeah, and, and we will, and we have companies, and we have industry, and we have innovators in Austria that uh, will play an important part in this, and, and can 
add their knowledge and know-how to, to this quest, which is really a global quest to build this up in time. And this is why I think we really need to push the ceiling and try to produce as much as we can in a sort of in a market sort of up a sort of scale up mar the market until 2030 because this is when when all of this will develop and and I don't honestly I don't, I'm not really so concerned about if it's one more or less or 10 percent plus minus I, I don't think any, anyone can really say this with authority because we're all guessing but I think basically we need to do as much as we can and, and that concerns electricity, yes, but also, and then hydrogen capacity. And there's also so many unknowns still, how much of this will be locally produced and directly used in, in around industry clusters, probably some of it, um, at least in the short term. This may change over time and then how will it all develop around hydrogen backbones. Um, Eventually, the import routes will become the more important issue, and because this is such slow infrastructure, um, I mean, pipelines, sort of changing, repurposing pipelines is a difficult business, and patching up, we've seen this in, in one presentation, patching up gaps in pipelines is sluggish, <laughs> even more sluggish. So, uh, so we in the, in the Ministry uh, of Climate Action, we're, we're at the moment looking at import routes for, for hydrogen, and just seeing which countries are, are sort of the most suitable and most promising partner countries to build up re these relationships. And the other thing, and this is where I come to efficiency, I think the other thing that we really bear in mind is that we're not repeating the mistakes of the past, yeah? So when we talk about hydrogen, we talk about green hydrogen. So I don't really, I mean, I know a lot of people have trouble remembering all of the colors on the chart of the different hydrogen types. My life is really easy because we're not only interested in green hydrogen. Yeah, and that's also written in the strategy. There's small exceptions, but if you really read the sentences to the end, you realize at the moment it's green hydrogen that we're interested in. And I think also this is the only thing that will save us from the climate crisis, so, so why worry about the rest? Um, and the other thing is to really be wise in what you use it for, because this will be a scarce and crazy expensive um, energy carrier. And so we're going to use it for the appliances that we have no answers for yet. And that is high temperature heat in the industry sector, steel making, uh, chemicals, fertilizers, and that is pro aviation probably, long haul shipping. And, and then the questions really start. Uh, there's a couple of areas where, you, where you, and under some circumstances it probably makes a lot of sense. Obviously also load sort of stabilizing and the electricity grid, uh, storage, um, but then there's also areas where we already know we, we, don't, you, we don't need it and we cannot waste it, and that is low temperature heat, that is heating buildings, that is uh, driving cars around with hydrogen. And this is all what we've set out in the strategy, I think, quite clearly. I'm really happy that we managed to do this because I'm coming back to the issue of efficiency and the issue of time. We have no time to sort of invest into, into things that are not going to work. And there's a couple of, there's a lot of questions that we don't have answers for, but there's also a lot of things that we already know. So no regret options and, and clear mistakes. Let's just not make them. Yeah, and let's, so let's focus. And then, and also let's build up all we can, okay, but let's also focus. Hildegard Eichberger, you mentioned at the beginning that the high price of energy will remain with us. We shall be get used to it. That's one element of steering demand. What other elements, levers do you see or what's your impression on how to tackle bringing down demand because we can't serve 400 terawatt hours? Yeah, it's quite it's quite interesting when you when we listen to the to the statements here that it seems that we have to sex up efficiency a bit uh, because it, it it seems that it's it's just not attractive uh, in in the discussion. Uh, hydrogen is much more attractive, but uh, as we call it, hydrogen is the champagne of energy transition, and uh, it's nice if you can drink champagne for every uh, in the morning already for brushing your teeth, but uh, that's not realistic. So we uh, as 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 champagne is expensive, hydrogen is expensive and we will not, uh, we, we really have to, to use it um, rarely and, 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 and it will be expensive and it will be rare. So, um, so the reason why I, I, I opt for high prices um, and the reason why I believe that's a, that's a good situation is uh, if we look at the last, let's say, 20 years, 
um, uh, energy prices were constantly very low. And uh, these low prices, uh, they, they trigger the behavior I call it behavior, is, uh, and, and, and everybody behaved like that, That's, uh, that it was just not worth anything. So we, we, tried, uh, we started to waste the energy. And you can see that very well if you look at industries. For example, if you look at the, uh, at the US, they have, uh, in, in comparison to Europe or, or also other uh, industries, they are quite inefficient. And uh, the reason is certainly because it's just, uh, they have very uh, cheap energy prices there. Uh, for them, what we have here, it's uh, unbelievable. Uh, they even complain if they have half price of what we do have. So what we see is, the higher the, the energy price, the more, um, uh, the more people will think about uh, saving energy. And uh, not only people in their private, because you can maybe uh, uh, live with one or two degrees lower uh, in, in, uh, in your heating, but they will think about new technologies. So a lot of people now think about heat pumps, they think about uh, changing cars to electric cars, and industry thinks about um, investing into new technologies, and that's because of these, these high prices. Uh, at the, 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 as, as high as the prices are now, everything pays off, everything. Uh, the problem is only that we don't know how long the prices will stay there. Um, and now investments, even uh, the, the, the rates that we have, I think one very important um, sector that we didn't talk about is, is buildings. Uh, because we know that there is, we, we, we have to get the rate of uh, restoring of, free, uh, of um, restoring buildings and making them more heat efficient. Um, we, we have to get this rate up. Um, but we will only be able to do that because it's really high investment uh, that, that you have to put into there. You only can do that if you know it pays off and that's investments, they pay off after the 20 years. So that's the reason why it's so important not to have high prices for two years, but also for the politics to make sure that energy prices will not come down to, the, uh, to where, they, where they've been. Um, because otherwise efficiency will not be sexed up. It's only sexed up if it really pays off and that's very often a long-term investment. Thanks a lot. So we've had first impressions and I would like to open now the floor for questions. We have one, Angela, also a board member of Club of Rome. And then two more, okay. Um, do we have microphones? Ah, okay, thanks, <laughs> great. Thanks. Uh, please, if you could uh, give your name uh, Good evening. and Thomas. the question, and then also whom you primarily address. Good evening. Uh, my name is Thomas Wollinger. I, I would like to take a um, question together with Mr. Klaus Fronius. We are from company Fronius. And yeah, thank you very much for all the discussions. Um, we just want to bring in that there are already a lot of uh, very successful companies in Austria in the renewable energy field. And just to give you a few numbers about the company Fronios, so each day about 1,700 PV systems are installed somewhere on our planet with an inverter produced in Austria. So all together each year about uh, 41 terawatt hours of renewable electric energy are produced with a product out of Europe, out of Austria. And this is uh, that you get a, a picture about 35 uh, river power plants like one on the Danube or five uh, nuclear power plants. So it's really a quite a big amount of energy. Um, and yeah, I think and the, the question basically basically goes in the direction of the policy making. Um, I think we should use for sure all the, those potentials we have in the companies in Austria, also in the biomass field, in photovoltaic, in recycling companies. And there are some challenges. There are challenges regarding um, um, employees. So we want to hire this and next year 2,000 employees. We have now at the moment 6,100. And so there should be as possible a framework also in Austria to get those uh, employees to also be able to produce those innovations in Austria, in Europe within the future. Um, 
And yeah, for sure, the, the supply chain is quite a big challenge. And so my ba basic question would be, uh, is it possible that the framework in Austria also uh, has good respect to all those issues that are uh, happening in the, in the companies in Austria? I say, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. So we will pass on. Maybe Angela, you can add then on your environmental technology study how strong the share of the of these um, companies is, and we are very glad to have this te technology export potential. And the hydrogen strategy, for example, is the most recent strategy that mentions this focus as well. And I will pass on the question to you, Judith. Afterwards, what can the framework? How can the CAN framework take care that Austrian companies are fostered and also that we have the right expertise here? And it's an ed education issue as well, I think, and, and uh, as, as a skill issue, basically. Yeah, I'm uh, Angela Köppel from Austrian Institute of Economic Research. I'm afraid I cannot add uh, a lot to the technolo uh, uh, environmental technology industry. Since we didn't uh, do it uh, uh, for, the, for quite a while, it has been no longer. It was Evie who is doing it now. Anyway, um, I uh, listening to all of you and also the way um, efficiency is taken up, uh, I wonder whether we understand the correct thing uh, we understand uh, efficiency correctly because we usually think of efficiency along uh, given technology pathways more or less. Uh, so improve, uh, um, make incremental changes in, in, in efficiency more or less. And uh, I would say that uh, when we are talking about energy transition, we need to think um, about efficiency of systems. Uh, so for example, uh, if you think uh, about mobility, then uh, is such a system would be to think in three terms, avoid, shift, and substitute. You know it quite well, Karl. Uh, but also in terms of, um, uh, of uh, cities, of buildings, we are still used to think in single buildings in, in, instead of uh, uh, a whole quarters of cities, because then there is uh, really new uh, efficiency potential would open up. And I also uh, would say that um, efficiency is not only an issue uh, of the demand side sectors, uh, but also of the supply side sectors. Thanks a lot. So there's a third question, and then we will begin to answer. So this efficiency system, maybe Theresa Vogel or? Whoever wants to take it, yeah. Third question was here: the man in the blue, in in the green, the front. Yeah. Uh, hello. Good evening. I'm Benoit. Uh, I'm just a regular civilian. Um, I have um, one question uh, because we've been uh, I've been hearing you talking about the the, um, the transition, um, but I haven't heard so much the the word sobriety or or. Reducing really consumption on, on, on this on the side of, of people and I would like to have a bit your your opinion on that how how does that look how, how do you how do you get people to really understand that they have to to reduce their consumption how, how do you get people to um, yeah to, to change paradigm in, in, in the way that the, they're approaching the, the energy consumption and uh, another aspect I, I, I haven't heard yet is about uh, the resources needed to um, to build this infrastructure that we need. Uh, we know that some material needs to be sourced uh, from other countries that are uh, already at war or that are not democracies. How, do, how does that look uh, in, in, the, in the route and the plan for, for Austria? Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. My first suggestion would be that the demand side on uh, how to get people would be Hildegard Eichberger from your past experience. And the resource demand for the infrastructure will probably be Mr. Eider and Mr. Kies. So, yeah. uh, back to Losch with the last question on this round. Then we have some 
answers and then some questions from online as well. Yeah. I, I would just have a short question to rather to Mrs. Eichberger because I think she has a Ökostrom AG, a very interesting model. Uh, also for me, it's kind of an energy community also with shareholders and, and bringing together the people with complete renewables. We, have, we didn't touch on the system efficiency, on the flexibility, on, on, the, on the issue when we come to close to 100% renewable, which we really want to achieve in 2030 already. We will have, uh, we will have to tackle that volatility of sun and wind. And, uh, uh, and I, I missed a little bit the ideas. Uh, it, it was said a little bit that, uh, uh, that with hydrogen we have also the possibility, or we shouldn't we impose on electrolyzers that they have to shut down when there's stress on the system instead of having uh, gas-fired uh, power plants to then help out in a way. Because that what we heard from Professor Fuchs also, uh, Haas, sorry, from Professor Haas, uh, that with the electromobility, that the problem is that a lot of we think it's pure uh, uh, renewables, but if you plug it into the system in, during a lot of times, it's not green electricity. And the hydrogen during a lot of times, we risk that it's not green hydrogen, but some kind of yellow, pinkish hydrogen. And to make it really sure that, uh, this, uh, that there's a reactive a re a system efficiency in that respect. And uh, to Mrs. Eichberger, I wondered whether you as a uh, as such an energy community company, uh, do you have ideas to cater for that uh, volatility of your production? You have your production of, uh, of wind and, and photovoltaics, and uh, <coughs> do you have ideas to enter also into the demand side, uh, uh <coughs> supplying consumers and leveling out uh, the problem of volatility? Thanks a lot. So we'll do it in the way that we just start over here and you answer the questions that were mainly addressed to you. So this was the companies was one of the questions and the other ones you want to take. Yeah, I just, I'm, it's easy for me because I can just pick the things that I feel I can say something to leave the rest <laughs> to the remaining panel <laughs> comfortable position. Um, or because all really good, all really hard questions to answer. Um, so the question by Fronios, um, and that, that to me, honestly, is the hardest because um, I think actually Theresia Vogel is a lot more competent to speak to this, but there's, there's two things I want to say. One is very sort of specific. Um, when, we, when we presented the hydrogen strategy, we also announced the launch of a platform that is just sort of intended to bring together science, industry, companies, policy makers to just implement the strategy together. Because it's one thing to have a piece of paper, but then we really actually want this to work. So we want to put this in practice and this is what we can't do alone. Yeah, so we're, we're inviting all stakeholders that play a part in this on the, on the production side, on the policy side, on the sort of thinking behind it um, together and see how we can make this work. Um, so this is an invitation to take part in this. And then the issue of the workforce, I think, I mean, this will not be very satisfactory for you as an answer, but I think that that, that is a major problem coming up, looming on the horizon or already here, but it's going to become bigger. Um, and, and it just goes to show how this is really an all society challenge. And it is a challenge with a lot of time lags and you cannot just build a workforce like this. And, and we already see that we were too late, basically. So, um, so all we can do now is to try and bring everybody on board and, and this concerns, yeah, education. It's been mentioned, Naki, you already said a lot about how this is, it, it just concerns everything and, and education and, and building up a workforce that can do the, all of the work that needs to be done is, uh, is a crucial part. Um, and then I'm going to say something that's maybe a bit un unorthodox to, um, to this sort of question, because uh, this is not very concrete, but I think it's equally important for producers of, of renewable electricity or elements thereof, because um, it's one thing to, we've reached a point where we can produce renewable electricity and, and we're also reaching a point of capacity where we we need to worry about where to put it, yeah? Because, Michi, you mentioned the volatility of the renewable um, production. 
when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, we need to start, our grid is not built for this. And this is what I try to say in my opening statement, we need to make these things come together. So we need, uh, we're working on an integrated network plan, looking at gaseous energy carriers and electricity, looking at where are the sinks, who needs energy and which type, and where are the likely big production sites, and where are the likely sort of looking into our neighboring countries, where, where are the other sort of sources coming in. And this needs to fit together so that companies that produce electricity can actually go on and grow, which we need. Okay, I'll try to find a statement to cover all the questions in, in, in one statement. I'm not sure if this is possible, but I'll try. Uh, first of all, I want to, to reply to the statement that we're all only talking about green. We as a storage provider for hydrogen in future or now, we don't care about the color because it's hydrogen. And uh, for a transition period, in the transition to the transition, we, we will see a lot of colors of hydrogen, I guess, because we have the gray one now in, 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 in the place. And why I'm telling that is we have a very tiny resource of renewables. And we also should talk, if you are talking about hydrogen, you have efficiency from electricity to hydrogen. This is a factor 70%, something like that. And if you revert it to uh, electricity again, you end up with 30, 35%. So the efficiency is poor. But I don't see any other solution on the, on the run since decades, because you need an energy carrier, as we stated. And so we also have to look how to use the small electricity renewable, renewables what we have. Is there a technology, a better technology, and a more efficient technology to produce hydrogen in the transition period? And if we talk about uh, methane uh, electrolysis, you need only one-fourth of your renewable electricity to get the same amount of hydrogen. And this is very, very valuable, especially in a transition period. And if you end up with a methane pyrolysis, if it, as it is called also, you get an additional resource. The additional resource is called carbon. Really, carbon, not carbon dioxide, it's carbon. And we're all based on carbon. And if you're talking about the future, carbon is a huge resource. You can have it as a kind of fertilizer for agriculture, which is needed all over the world. Yeah. And you can go, carbon is also diamonds. You need only small amounts. But between, you have graphite, you have graphene. You also can have carbon uh, for, let's say, the new steel, if you, if you think about that. Yeah? So when you're talking about resources, you get a lot of resources if you split methane into hydrogen as an energy carrier and carbon as a resource. And this is the, the case that we are thinking a lot of out of the box, and we are here in the Club of Rome. Yes, we know this is not green, it's turkeys or something like that. Because we will need it in the transformation period. Because if, you want, if we want to get rid of, of uh, methane, we also need, we can't do that with zero and one like in the digital. It, it's not possible, as we see it now. So we need some, some, some pathways. And if you can use this methane to split into carbon and hydrogen, why not for years? Why not? Because it's CO2, let's say, almost zero. You can't get zero with technologies. And uh, one, one uh, 
I think I'm not an expert on that, but I, I think all questions are related to the behavior of humankind. And if you talk, if you talk about efficiency, we also have to talk about rebound effects. And if you talk about rebound effects, I think there is a lot of uh, research also needed on that, how to avoid rebound effects for the humans. Because we have huge efficiencies if we're talking about televisions. Going back 20 years ago, nobody was talking about, let's say, uh, LEDs or something like that. You, you saved a lot of energy, but still you are not having only one TV in, in uh, your, your home. You have four, you have five, something like that. So the one TV is, 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 is very efficient, but if you, if you consume four, then it's a different story. And so I think it's really the, 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 the rebound. You, you can do that as well with cars and, and all, all, all things like that. It's rebound. First step to efficiency, I don't have four TVs at all. <laughs> and I, I never had. I, never, I don't have any. <laughs> so I would like to come back to the point of, of Thronios about framework in Austria and what can we do to support the Austrian enterprises, something like that it was. And it, uh, no one will wonder here, my point is the Austrian enterprises are uh, successful because they are very innovative. Uh, this is the point, because Austria is a small country with high costs on production, so Austrian enterprises will be successful where they are innovation front runners. This is very simple, because then the price is, is not interesting for the consumers at least. Yeah? So what we have to care for is that this innovation uh, part is, is delivered by the framework. This means also money in R&D and innovation projects as well as by the first uh, movers, they have, if, 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 it's, uh, if it all is, is fine, they can be in Austria to show what is possible and the rest has got to go to a global market at least. Because you mentioned the numbers and the big numbers of Fronius are not only in Austria. No? So it's, it's clear you have to show it's, it's working, it's the better product, go to the global market. So this is this point. Because I think only with Frontrunner in that field we can have success, global successful enterprises. And then there was a, a point about efficiency and, and look not only on a technology path and then one technology but also on the system efficiency. I totally agree and I would say in R&D and also in the innovation we are on that way. Because in innovation there is at least a change now, a discussion now we had on as far as up to now, we had only the, the topic which is, which is called TRL, as a technology readiness level. And now there is really a movement in mind which is shifting from the single TRL to a system readiness level, as an SRL, as well as a market readiness level. And these are different things, at least. So this, there is really a big discussion ongoing in R&D about the topics because everyone sees we have, we can gain a lot of efficiency wins if we look to whole systems, to integrated systems. Uh, there, were, there was also talking about sector coupling. To I totally agree to that. If we look to a special region, we have to improve also the, the, the whole flow, energy flows within this system. And that makes it necessary to have, there we need really the framework, because if you look to it, it's a totally different framework. Some have the electricity, you have the gas, you have heat, you have different others, you have uh, working together between industry enterprises and then communities, uh, so it's, it's totally new. So this is really important, and that the framework is really important. And uh, then there was a question, I would like to shift to that also, again, uh, how to make people change their lives uh, and, and how to make them behave uh, in the right order. <laughs> I would say, I, I mentioned it very at the beginning, you have to create a desirable picture of the future. If, you, if you're not uh, able to deliver that, it, it doesn't help to, to promote staffing and sufficiency scenarios or the apocalyptic scenarios. We had that in religions, religions didn't work. So you have to have this picture for them. What is the picture of the future, what we want to reach? And at least it's not, it's not about energy because energy is not 
what is energy to people? They want to have a warm home, they want to cook, they want to have, uh, I don't know, cool areas around their home, green areas in the cities, and so on and so on. And they, have to, they want to have energy whenever they need it. So this is what they're desiring. They are not desiring shrinking the demand of energy or get the, the best uh, performancing, uh, I don't know, TV. Uh, it's, it's not the wish of them. The wish is to have a good life with an affordable energy, energy at least. So, but we have to deliver a picture where they are moving into the right direction because otherwise you really have this lock-in, you have this, people are now discussing, can I get out of gas, what can I do? No, then I, I, I buy a new gas stove before it ends. Yeah. So we have really to create the picture and then to offer also solutions to them. But if you have only apocalyptic uh, pictures of the future, no one will follow. I unfortunately lost my pen, so I, I have a problem with a lot of questions, a lot of answers. <laughs> but uh, I will come back um, to you because you asked two very, very important, um, but I think also a little bit dangerous questions. First, you, you already answered uh, about the behavior. I would turn it around and say, um, well, we can change your, not only you, but people's behavior. Um, I think policy can. They can make rules, what to do or what not to do. We don't like that. They can make um, taxes. In German, it's Steuern. So I don't know the English translation that that, that in the same sense, but um, nobody likes that either. Um, you can apply it for Bund, we can hire you, we can pay you money for it to do what we do, that changes behavior. But I think the most important thing what's happening now, and it's already happening, is that people are going out on the street, um, they're making their voices heard. Um, it's basically the next, I can tell you, the next generation already. Um, and that shapes policies, that shapes um, companies, that shapes um, one of us. So I think that's that's what needs to happen. We need to have strong voices um, of people which are ready and willing to to make this decision. And like you said, it's going to be probably going to be more expensive because we are in this situation because we made mistakes in the past. We made the mistake to of not taking into account the external cost of, of fossil fuels. Um, so we need, yeah, I think we need to, to stick together, um, make the voices heard and allow the policies and the companies and everybody to make um, the right decisions. And um, second one is also a very, very good question. Um, I said it's a dangerous question because um, um, there's a lot of flaws in the, the technologies we are, um, we are seen as the, 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 yeah, the, the rescue, the, 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 the green technologies. Why are there flaws? Because most of them or some of them depend on materials that are very critical um, in, in, um, in the mining example, uh, electromobility um, is, the, I think, the most prominent example. Um, I think it's dangerous because there's a problem in everything, and most of the time, people asking those questions, I'm sorry, looking at you, <laughs> um, are the ones who don't want to change. So we stick, um, we find, we try to find reasons why not to switch to different technology, because we don't want to change behavior. Um, so I think that's, that's a very important, a very, very hard decision you have to make to set on technologies we might, might not be perfect. Like um, Brian Haas said, an electric car is not perfect unless we have 100% renewable energy. But when you start um, building or inventing, producing, buying electric cars, once the electricity is 100% renewable, then we're too late. Um, so we have, we have very hard targets. It's not a politi political target. It's a, it's a climate change target. Um, I think that should drive pretty much all of us. Um, one, one more comment, I think, to the efficiency, not the system efficiency, but um, generally on the way we, we, we um, use or we use the efficiency argument in the renewable energy discussion, especially in hydrogen, of course. Um, yeah, there is a efficiency losses if you trans uh, convert electricity to hydrogen back to um, whatever you need. But you're driving combustion engines and cars, the cars we mostly use today, there are heatings. There are better heatings than their mobility devices, and nobody's complaining about that. So uh, you should really be careful with those arguments when, when they're absolutely correct. So don't get me wrong, especially when you say, talked about the system efficiency, but we should not allow those arguments in the wrong context to stop us in, in our transition or our, our dis the decisions we make. Sorry, <laughs> getting a dry mouth here. 
You left a lot for me. Thanks very much. Uh, no, but but thanks that you that you uh, the, that you answered already uh, part of, of of your questions, and I I, I just want to add because I, I completely agree with what you what you said about um, people and changing their behavior. And I think there's a there's a reason why most energy models also of the EAA um, they don't see a huge potential in individual behavior change. And I think the reason is um, because that's not so easy in our system because just switching down the heat or, uh, or, or I don't know, switching off the light uh, doesn't really bring a lot of efficiency gain or a lot of energy reduction. So what people really need, they need practical solutions. And my, uh, what I can say as a, as a, as a company, it has been mentioned now, um, we see our, ourselves very, very much as bringing energy transitions to the people and we want to do that with the people. And what we see is that there are more and more people who want to be part of that. And already I don't see people or consumers as the problem, to be honest, uh, because I have the feeling if you provide them with uh, good solutions, then uh, they will want to uh, follow down the route. We see that because you cannot, I think at the moment, you, you need to wait for two, uh, two years or so to, to get a new solar panel on your roof or your uh, cars. You can only buy the most expensive electric cars now for the next months because everything else is sold out. So people really, they, they take these steps even if they don't pay off in terms of money. Um, so I am very um, confident that if, if, we, if, if we manage to provide the good solutions, then a lot of people will follow and then more and more will follow because uh, th that's the effect that happens. So I'm quite positive on that. And uh, then, so if I may, I come, uh, I come to your questions on the, um, on the volatilities. And I mean, that's an issue certainly. And I'm, I'm glad that you ask it because we, we tend to answer this question from the perspective of our old energy system, which is we have a few big power plants and then we have a system that relies on them and then we have storage and we will need big storage, sure, uh, but this is not the only way we store energy of the volatile uh, renewables. This will not only be the gas field that we now, uh, where we, where we now pump in the, the uh, hydrogen, uh, this, this will be needed, but we also need other more flexible, more smart uh, ways of dealing with energy. And um, uh, two issues that we look at is, um, one is the flexibility man managing, so if, for, for those who don't know what I'm talking about, for example, if you have a cool house or so, then uh, you don't have to um, cool it at exactly the, from eight to, six to five or so, but you can do it uh, at other times when maybe there's a lot of energy, free energy on the, on the market and so if you have a, um, a, a, an asset like this you can put it uh, as a uh, to, as, as an into the that's difficult for me in English to be honest um, so you can put it into the energy system uh, in order to uh, get the volatilities out so you can say okay I provide this I will switch it off when we when there's too little energy and I will switch it on when there's too much energy so that's the management of flexibilities and that's something we look into uh, because that's also something where you need small providers um, and then the second issue I think is also um, the small storage capacities we, that now come up. Uh, a lot of people build their own storage uh, for energy, although that's not uh, cost efficient, to be honest, but uh, they, uh, they do that and they have it in cars. We will have a lot of electric cars and a lo lot of electric batteries in future, and we can use that as flexibility for our system. That's not sure not the only flexibility management we have or the uh, storage management, but um, at least for um, day and night volatil uh, volatilities, we can use that. And I think we need to be smarter, and, and, and that's my last word, sorry, uh, to be so long, but uh, I think it's an important aspect also. We didn't talk about using digital te technologies better for the energy transitions. We didn't even mention that, and I think we cannot end this discussion without even mentioning that. We need to be smarter on uh, using digital transition also for the energy transition. Thanks a lot for being so condensed and you see the broad expertise we have here together to have it that lively and, and, diff and diverse. Um, I still would like to give each of you 
a kind of a closing statement, but just not statement, just three sentences max. <laughs> just how are you going out of this discussion here um, that um, we have entitled how do we implement the energy transition in practice? What's your yeah, final two sen sen sentences? I will then start later on uh, from left to right from you, Hildegard Eichberger. But first, there is two more questions online. Um, and one is, is there any innovation for biogas production in Austria? Anybody here on the board panel to know or in the auditorium? <laughs> Uh, biogas uh, is, there's also a huge uh, potential in Austrian enterprises in the biogas field because we have a lot of enterprises dealing with uh, small scale biogas uh, vessels and they are really up to date with technology. But at present the, a strong focus is on gasification on wood in that content because biogas itself, I mean, the processes are well known, we know that we can clean it and, and bring it into the gas uh, grid, for example. We, can, we know that we can use it also other ways. So this is not a new topic, but at, at, mo at the moment, as a really uh, a big effort goes in the direction of gasification of, of wood and, and biomass, because uh, the processes are, let me say, at least cleaner than the traditional uh, production. And the idea behind that is at least to use it then in, in the uh, mobility sector, for example. I mean, this by, so, yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. There's one more question. As currently um, investment streams to fossil fuels, 4.6 trillion US dollar from the 60 biggest banks worldwide uh, have flown since the Paris Agreement. The question is, don't we need something like the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty to move investment away? I mean, there may, maybe that was a question to, <laughs> to your um, investment uh, slide. Do we need such a treaty? <laughs> a non-fossil, uh, uh, yeah, non-proliferation treaty. I mean, very creative idea, but um, I'll just give an ad hoc answer. Uh, I, I actually think we need a kind of decarbonization treaty uh, along the carbon law that I mentioned, if that would be implementable. But let me just uh, comment on the non-proliferation treaty. Um, I mean, it is closely over 50 years old now, if I remember correctly, or close to 50 years old, and um, has really not s stopped spread of nuclear weapons worldwide. I think the danger might be as high as it was once upon a time during the Cold War, or perhaps even higher. So I'm really worried about that analogy, to be honest. I hope we can do much better on decarbonization. Let's put it that way. Thanks a lot. So let's close the panel with a final statement, and then I hand over to closing of the uh, whole event. Please. Yeah. I have the first word now, sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Three sentences max. No, that's, kind of that's thing, absolutely yeah. fine. Um, I, I, start, I, I end as a, the same way I started. Uh, we, we need to be bold. We need to, uh, we need to go to crisis mode, but we should do it in a positive way. I think that we can do it. And um, I think we have to change our attitude towards being proud of what we can achieve in the next years because the 20th, 20th century was the one where we built wealth with oil and the 21st should be the ones where we keep wealth on this earth uh, within the boundaries of this planet. And we should be proud of that and we should uh, try to do that and the time is now. Thanks. up what you just said, we have to be bold um, and bring the discussion on my, my last couple of sentences to a, sorry, <laughs> to, to, um, down to a very uh, different level of discussion because we discussed big pictures, we discussed strategies, we discussed a lot of numbers. Um, it comes down to, to we have to get projects started. We have to um, get frameworks right, we have to get investments right, um, 
we have to get the education right, um, and we have, I don't know, there's tons of tons of things um, that have to come together to make renewable projects work. At the beginning it's harder, at the end it becomes easier, but we need to get started, and we need to, so we need to be bold. Um, I think everyone in this room, um, I just can invite you to, to take part in projects um, and take on the challenge. Yeah, I would agree to that. Uh, stop talking, <laughs> come to action, <laughs> get into projects and then yeah, roll out projects. Uh, it's like that, just do it. And I'm, I'm very optimistic that, we, that it's possible to gather all the, the front runners and the willing and roll out projects with them because you see it, it's happening now. Three sentences. Yes, we do. We do a lot of projects. Second, we need all kind of renewables what we can get as soon as possible. Third, we, we have also to target always and have in mind security of supply because that is needed as well. And so I would like to close in German dass man rechtzeitig darauf schaut, dass man es hat, wenn man es braucht. That's the perfect bridge for me, thank you. Because um, I'm going to do something a little bit cheeky with my closing statement. Uh, we said we need to get to work and there's a lot to be done and I am hiring. And so if anyone in the audience <laughs> online or here uh, knows a thing or two about energy systems, about has ideas about how to decarbonize the industry and help industry decarbonize, has ideas on how to reform electricity and gas markets so that they work for the energy transition that we need, is interested in biogas, um, talk to me. Find me on the internet, email me. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the very condensed uh, expertise you brought in here and for all the steps to the future each of you brought in now. And to this step to the future, the future here to the event is with Martin Hoffmann and I hand over. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, guests, uh, as we have seen today, the world and uh, the energy sector in particular are in a major transformation process that has only just begun. The way we produce and consume energy will change fundamentally in the coming decades if we take climate targets seriously. And uh, when I heard Naki, he spoke from the Club of Rome, from the report which impressed us as young people in the early 70s. And uh, we discussed uh, what the Club of Rome and the report told us that we have to change the system, that we have to change the world, not only the energy system. Uh, it's good that we started with the process. On the other hand, it's a little bit also tristesse when we see that the current uh, generation, 50 years later, have to discuss the same problems. And of course, when I hear to the panel, and I thank to the panelists, and I thank uh, to the discussion uh, leader, uh, it was, I heard great ideas, and I think we will go out and believe uh, that the people who are responsible in this country or in this uh, organization and in these institutes are doing the best 
to change the current way and to realize the transition. The transition, but not only of energy, like Mrs. Vogel said very clear. What's energy? Of course we have to discuss about energy. But when we discuss about the transition, and, and if we discuss, we are here uh, by the invitation of the Club of Rome. If we discuss the, uh, the goals of uh, the, the uh, former report, then we have to cuss, uh, discuss and to change also our how we do it, how we handle it, how we live, how we live not only in our continent, if we live also in the whole world, and if we speak about transformation, we have also include uh, not only the industrialized world, also the third world and the whole world together. Without include the other parts of our, uh, of our Earth, of our uh, planet, we will not be able to uh, make efforts in the climate uh, crisis and the climate uh, change. Uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, by the way, by the way, I want uh, to thank very, uh, my thanks, great thanks to our joint vice president, Dr. Losch, who made this event together with the Club of Rome and the World Energy Council. I think that's a good idea. We should continue. We fight and we work for the same idea. We have the same targets. We have the same goals. And I think we should force our uh, joint uh, uh, interests and our joint uh, 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 doing. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the end of my few words, my colleague, Dr. Hoffman, I thank, have also to thank very much to him and the World Energy, uh, the, the Club of Rome Chapter Austria, who organize uh, this event mainly, will uh, say a few words about uh, the Club of Rome. Uh, I spoke about the changing, the changing of uh, our lifestyle and all our style of economy and how we use energy it's not only efficiency we have to discuss, it's the way uh, one of the colleagues in the panel spoke about for TV and other things. I think that's a real, or we can speak in the traffic about cars and so on. We have to change if we will discuss this seriously. And one reason is very, very important. In the last months, we have a discussion. We didn't believe in Austria and in the center of Europe uh, that we, in the last decades, we didn't believe that will come a time we have to discuss about social problems with energy support, with energy demand, and with energy use. Uh, if I believe to all the experts, to all the experts, we this will not be the end of the discussion. Therefore, when we speak about transformation, we have to realize 
the social problem, the social aspect, we, has, we um, have to humanize energy. Thank you very much. Well, well, I guess it's over and we are finished. <laughs> well, I, I don't know what happened. Surprise, surprise. I just would say uh, thank you very much for everybody coming and contributing. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of connection to the former Club of Chrome stuff, but I guess we just get to the drinks and we will see the next time. What happens today, I don't know. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening. Und im Zentrum von der Leimut, das ist nicht die, 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 die.